much, and thank you, Pat, also for uh, uh, opening up the session today. It is great to be here. Uh, I love being around manufacturers, and it's indeed an honor for me to represent Vermeer and the NAM. So let me just get started. A um, little introduction on Vermeer, and then I will talk about exactly the things Ken mentioned, healthcare and export, as well as lean, and then we'll get into a little bit on policies for NAM and our opportunities and, and also challenges as manufacturers in this country. We're located in Iowa, in Pella, Iowa. Um, my father started the business 64 years ago. We are privately held. My brother Bob and I have worked together for over 30 years. He is now the chair of the, of the business and I'm the CEO. And we do have a third generation. And I don't have time to get into it, but as a privately held company, we've been very intentional about transitions and family involvement in the business in many areas, from an ownership council to involvement on a day-to-day -day basis, and uh, kind of a, a gauntlet that you need to go through if you want to be involved in the business. But uh, we are, our main location is in Pella, and we really are in four sectors of the business. My dad invented the first round hay baler back in 1971, and many people think that's who Vermeer is, that we start, we're just all agriculture. We love our agricultural part of the business, but that's only a piece of our business. So today we still have uh, balers, rakes, and mowers, and um, mostly a domestic market for us, although we have a JV partner that we do are able to work uh, worldwide with. We also have an environmental part of our business, and um, uh, my dad actually was able to help invent the first stump grinder back in 1958 to grind out a stump. He had a farmer who came to him and said, hey, Gary, can you help me figure a way to, to bring the cylinder across a stump so we can grind it out and so we don't have to burn it out or put a chain around and pull it out. And together they figured out how to make a, a machine that would go back and forth across the stump and cut it out and you wouldn't have to do the burning and the, and the pulling and all that. From that, really developed our environmental segment of the business. So today we still market all sizes of stump grinders around the world, but also multi-line in chippers, um, tub and horizontal grinders for wood waste and being used a lot in biomass right now, and also trommel screens and compost turners. So we have a whole array of environmental equipment. Underground actually started in our company when we developed a, a, a PTO trencher to put tile in the ground in Iowa to get the water off it to put more land in production. And from that it evolved our entire line of trenchers, both rubber tire and track mounted trenchers, as well as directional drilling, which was a big growth, has been a big growth area starting for us in the 90s. And then uh, specialty excavation is kind of came from that trencher also, and we do have large track mounted equipment that can trench 20 feet deep or up to 5 feet wide in solid rock. So pretty phenomenal machines for the pipeline industry. But we also now put a drum on the front of some of these machines and uh, are, are able to do surface mining for various minerals. So we are in copper, in gypsum, in limestone, in iron ore, in iodine, in bauxite, really all kinds, industrial diamonds, all kinds of minerals. And you can there eliminate the drilling and blasting of mining and, and literally mine what you need when you need it. I think it's the perfect lean machine because it takes a ton of steps out and also costs out. And that machine on the bottom is the largest machine we've ever built and we've now uh, built m several of them. And they are pretty much all going to iron ore in West Australia. Uh, 400,000 pounds uh, of equipment and has to be transported in this country on five different um, trucks. So um, a wide range, you can see, from a small stump grinder or a walk-behind trencher to a 400,000-pound surface miner. Uh, obviously, all of you know the importance of after you sell that first piece of equipment, you want to have the right parts and service and training and know-how. So we really try to focus in on life cycle management, cutting-edge tools that, that really are the uh, key to making our equipment productive. And so uh, another big area of the business for us. We are located in Pella. We have 1.5 million square feet of manufacturing space and offices in our uh, Pella location. <laughs> but we uh, also did establish a manufacturing, small manufacturing company in China as a defensive move. We were being copied in every, every which way on our directional drills back in the late 90s. 
And so really the only way to keep a presence was to be able to have some manufacturing there. We still export 25 to 50 percent of every machine we build in Beijing. We still export from Pella to, to keep that proprietary knowledge. But it's basically for our Asian markets um, and emerging markets like in Russia and in India. We have uh, a joint venture with the Lely Corporation and together we own a manufacturing company in Germany for um, also for, for the forage business and we have a small manufacturing plant in South Dakota for recycling business. And we really support our dealers worldwide with regional offices and so who's the Netherlands? Uh, we have been there for over 30 years and support the Europe, Middle East and Africa area and in these offices we've got people with multiple language skills, um, also product specialists or solution specialists that know the markets really well and can come alongside our dealers and help them be the most effective that they can be. Another regional office is in Singapore for Asia Pacific and in um, Valinas, Brazil for Latin America. Um, we actually have a little bit more than 2,500 now. We're, we're you know, getting close to 3,000 employees worldwide, again, with over two-thirds coming out of Pella. And we do work, in most cases, through our distribution group. My dad decided in 1958 that selling through shortliners was not going to, to move the company very fast. So started setting up Vermeer Sales and Service. And I mean, at the time, they had two or three products to sell. Uh, and today we have uh, an industrial organization both in North America and around the world that's basically focused only on Vermeer. And on our ag products or the forage products, we, we do sell through short line and also through um, uh, some of the, the multi-line channels. Um, okay, a little bit about lean. We, um, lean, is, lean is part of our culture. And I, I love the process. And as I told Pat yesterday, I could talk two days on lean. So putting this into a few minutes is very difficult. So this is going to be very high level. But in the 90s, when we were having the growth, particularly from the directional drilling market, we saw our profits and our gross margin go down. And we already had independent directors, outside directors, on our board. One of them was from the Han Corporation. And he kept saying to us, you need to understand what continuous improvement's about. He said, you can't keep adding the buildings, you can't keep adding the people, like our manufacturing person said. Just give me more people, give me more buildings, but give me more equipment, I can make whatever you want. Right, but the cost, it's impossible. So um, we, we started investigating um, across town, Pella Corporation was doing some wonderful things in, on the lane journey, and Han and, and other companies, and, and started benchmarking and looking what would it take and then um, I went to a conference in, and it was actually, we'd already sort of started, but in 1998, and uh, really heard from Art Byrne, one of those great gurus from Wiremold, uh, about what it would take to get on the lean journey. And actually he said to me, Mary, if you're gonna, if you're gonna sponsor this, if you're gonna champion this in your company, you need to be on a Kaizen event one week every month. And I sort of fell off the chair and said, what, you're kidding me? And he said, no, he said, you will learn more about your people, your processes, and your products, your strengths and weaknesses, by being on an event than anything else you can do. So I was not on one every month, but over the next two years, I was on one event every other month at least, so 12 events out of 24 months. And uh, so, so were my senior people. And we, uh, we found that this indeed was exactly what we had to do. And, after 15 years on this journey, and you, those of you who've been on the journey, you know this is true, all you do is see more opportunity. More opportunity, there's so much more to do. And I love the quote of Teichi Ono, after 40 years with Toyota, he, would, he said, I think we're starting to get it. And, and you know, that's the way you feel, right? The longer you're on the journey, the more there is to do. Um, just a couple of, of, um, of best practices. For us, a best practice has been really focusing in on a model line. And we, we didn't do this initially, okay? We, it was a couple years into the journey. And we really started focusing on one line and we actually produce more brush chippers than anything else as far as numbers. So right now, our tack time is 49 minutes and that's, I realize some of you have tack times of 30 seconds. And we, you know, that's always so phenomenally difficult for us to understand. But ours is 49 minutes, that's the lowest one we have. And uh, so every 49 minutes, the, the material comes in and the two bin system on the sides, the machines move, the standard work is load level for the 49 minutes. 
And our, on our brush chipper line, we continue to learn. It's maybe better called a learning line than a model line. So we continue to learn and take that learning and, and disseminate it throughout of all of our plants and actually worldwide. But you know, big picture, big picture, it was 52 days from raw steel to out the door, and we do a lot of machining, weld, paint, assembly, the whole thing. We're in, vert vertically integrated. 52 days, because we did it in batches of 50, because actually that was the best way to do it, right? That was the most efficient way to do it. And we went from 52 days to now a little over two days from raw steel to out the door. We've improved quality. Hours per unit was something like 80 for weld and assembly. And by taking all the runaround time, the time people were looking for parts, they were, had bad parts, they were looking for the tools, and, and bringing and load leveling everything to the 49 uh, minutes. We uh, were now in, in the not only 20s, it says there, a couple weeks ago we did another breakthrough event and moved one of the chippers, the mix model, to a different line where it fit better and now we're gonna be in the, in the low teens actually in hours per unit. So, I mean, we improved our safety, we've improved the quality, our customer satisfaction by going to a, a one piece flow system. Um, and just, you know, a little bit, um, and this doesn't maybe even show up quite as well, but when we were from 2000 to 2008, we had about the same amount of volume. We went through the downturn of 2001 to 2003, like, like I think most of you probably did. Um, but from 2000 to 2008, we had the same volume with about a third less people. You all know, I mean, that's the big power of lean. Another big power of lean is inventory, and particularly inventory at our dealerships. And, and again, we had, have had decreases in the inventory at our dealers. And because what we found in 2001 to 3 is one of the biggest stumbling blocks for us to get things rolling again after that downturn was the fact that we had way too much inventory in the dealerships. And we had not figured out a way to, to flow, to actually replenish um, inventory as, as we were doing on the plant floor in our dealerships. And um, so just, just want to mention this one other best practice, and um, Jason Henry uh, from our team is going to be talking more about this in detail in one of the breakout sessions, I think, tomorrow morning. But basically, it's a replenishment system. So every, we started, again, model line. We started with the chippers, and we started with a few dealers first, and then we expanded it that when they would sell a chipper, and they'd have a footprint that they want on their yard, when they'd sell a chipper, we would line one up the next day on the yard to get ready to ship to them. And um, this has helped our dealer's inventory turns. We have fresher inventory, much fresher inventory. Um, and it's really helped their financial situation. And so what we found is the red line is, is the old way of ordering. It was we were batch ordering. We incentivized our dealers to order at the beginning of every month, and so they would order big time at the beginning of every month, but guess what? In reality, they didn't sell it that way. So as, as you go to the right of the graph, you can see at the end when we had all of our domestic dealers on, our retail, what was retailing and what our dealers were ordering were absolutely right in line. And uh, that has been uh, a major deal for us and why now, through the downturn of 2009, we did not have nearly the amount of obsolete and old aging inventory in our dealership. So replenishment, we've got about 20 different products on that. We need to have a certain volume to put them on replenishment. Although I would tell you, my dealers will tell me, even with their big equipment, they would say, I wish you would just put it on replenishment. So I don't even have to think about ordering it. When I sell one, you've got another one ready for me. So this has been a, a, huge, um, a huge best practice for us. And I guess I just want to say a little something about the model line. Um, the fact that it really, it, for us, having dedicated resources and sometimes pulling the, the uh, KPO people from a couple different plants to focus on one plant to make sure you've got things going the right direction is very important. Um, and you know, all of, all of these uh, bullet points are important, but I just want to emphasize again that last one about really trying to make sure you've got top management involved. Um, this year is our 15th year and we're redoing our training and all of our employees again are gonna go through lean training. We did that before, we're gonna do it again because we have new people, we need refreshers. We have about 70% of our folks have been on at least one Kaizen event. We keep trying to get that to 100. Uh, 
not easy, and you probably, you probably can identify with that. But the other thing we're doing this year is um, we've been able to host a number of public events for TBM. And uh, so we're, gonna, we're doing our own public events this year. So a couple weeks ago, we had a, what we call CI Blitz Week. And we had events in China, which reported out uh, from a dealership from, in South Carolina. We had our Wildcat Freeman, South Dakota plant on an event in about four plants on our, on our Vermeer Mile. And, and it, was, it was great. And we had about half of the executives on those events. And we've got another CI Blitz Week coming up in a couple months. And we will have the other half of the exec team on that, those events. And again, it's just to remind everyone how important it is to go see, to get involved, and, to, uh, and also to model the fact that this stuff is really important for our business. So I, I guess I can't emphasize enough top management being involved in every part of the process. And I will say in 15 years, I don't think I've missed a single Friday presentation uh, if I'm in town. I mean, if I'm in town, that is absolute top priority. And, um, you know, you, you love how people learn and, and the language they start talking and how we start thinking differently and we solve problems differently if we're all on the journey. In healthcare, we've taken lean to healthcare as well and maybe a couple other interesting things. Uh, we've been self insured since 1983. We were looking for how do, you, how do you always contain costs. I mean, we've always been looking at how to contain costs, okay, since 83. About 10 years ago, though, we decided to establish a clinic on our campus because we had a, enough mass of people, we had 3,000 at that time, uh, to be able to have some services. We started with the hearing tests and, you know, some of the occupational uh, kinds of um, uh, opportunities. But we've added primary care, okay? so. You can go into our clinic or a spouse can go into our clinic and there is no wait, no paperwork, and no copay, okay? And average wait time, one minute. We've done several Kaizen events in the clinic. And uh, we, get, uh, we get a lot of usage. Uh, we have, you know, multiple people every day coming into the clinic for a little this or that. It takes them much less time than going even into our small town to go to the Pella Clinic. This is done, operated on a third-party basis, so it is operated under the, the guidance of the Pella Regional Clinic. But five years ago, we also put in a pharmacy, and this is also third-party run. This is by Walgreens right now, and uh, do a lot of scripts, um, okay? And it's by far the least expensive way for people to get their medicines. And part of the clinic also is a wellness area where every employee is encouraged and every spouse or partner is encouraged to come in once a year, get your blood drawn, you know, do the flexibility test, do your weight, all that. And then you get a counseling session with a wellness uh, person to tell you about what are the things you should be working on, your cholesterol, your weight, smoking, whatever. And um, just kind of interesting, because of this, we have seen dramatic decreases in, in several areas, in blood pressure, in cholesterol, and body mass. Now, un unfortunately, we're going the wrong way on tobacco, and we are a totally non-smoking tobacco campus, but um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna dig into this a little bit more. And again, you do Pareto's on these to find out what's going on here. Um, and some of the numbers are still being checked. It's very hard to get, how do you, how do you justify this, right, from an ROI standpoint? Um, I can tell you that we have very good health coverage and we are lower than the national average by quite a bit per employee and by even by the Iowa average. And some of the information we've been working with a group called Milliman in, in Iowa shows us that our, um, our pharmacy usage is about 15% more than the average, but the cost is 30% per usage less, 30% less. And on the clinic side, we also have higher usage, but, but less definitely less cost. And so we're kind of working those numbers to make sure we're, we've got all the right numbers in there. Uh, but we also know that bef before we had the clinic, when we started the clinic, we found out that 30% of our employees did not have a primary care physician, didn't have one. So what happens, then people get to the point where they have really serious illnesses. There's no preventative kinds of steps being taken and some really big costs, and, and obviously, you know, big trauma for your families and your people. 
So um, the health here on site, I think, has been one of one of the real big benefits that our employees have seen, as well as the the lower costs um, in in prescriptions and just the ease of being able to go there, pick up your prescription, or go in for a for a uh, an appointment. On export, uh, for us, uh, exports has been a, definitely a part of our growth path. You can see as a percentage for many years we were in the you know teens, low teens percentage as a, as how much of our business went outside the U.S. Now we're right around that 30 percent mark. Uh, right now a little bit less because our domestic market's doing really well. But um, outside the U.S. is includes also the manufacturing in China and in Germany. And we never had those jobs in Germany. We're, we're never in Iowa. Those those it's a joint venture over there. Uh, but still, substantial amount of our outside the U.S. business is export, and it means jobs for our people. And uh, I'm very, um, that's why I'm really honored to be on the President's Export Council, because I'm very passionate about exports and the need to make sure that this country is a great place from which to export, and I'll talk a little bit more about that with the NAM as well. Um, the, the interesting thing is I started looking at how many languages we speak in our regional offices. We are just a little bit short of 30 different unique languages spoken in our regional offices with about 18 unique languages spoken at Vermeer Impella. And so the language capability and the product specialty capability are very important in our regional offices to help us be able to export. And, and really, exports for us does mean growth. It means growth, it means jobs. Uh, most of our people understand where machines are going when they're coming off the line. They know where they're going. They know they're going, this one's going to Sweden, and this one's going to Australia, and this one's going to Brazil. And they know that they have jobs a lot because we export. So export for us has been extremely important. But you do need to have the right processes. There's a lot of compliance issues. We've also added a lot of people on our staff just to do a lot of the compliance issues. Um, you need to have sometimes some variability, make some adjustments in the product, absolutely. Um, you need the right training and you do need the right talent around, around the uh, world and in your, in your home base as well. But exports is a great opportunity and uh, of course always looking at how you can improve those processes. So let me uh, transition over to the um, National Association of Manufacturers and um, talk a little bit about the, the history of the NEM to start with. 1895, a group of manufacturers got together in Cincinnati, Ohio, because they were in a recession, and they knew that one thing that maybe they could do to help their companies and the country get out of recession was to be able to export products to other, other countries. And so that's why they started it, was to export product, manufactured product. And the NAM has now had about 117 year history, and early on also this group called for a Department of Congress, uh, Commerce. So the Commerce Department was a, was a result of the NAM. Um, and I think what's, what's always interesting, and you probably all fight this, is some of the myths that, that are go on um, you know, in the media and in the general public about manufacturing, oh, we're losing manufacturing, et cetera. Well, the truth is we have 21% of the global manufacturing is in the United States, followed by 15, 16 in China, and 12 in Japan. And you know, China's a huge economy, and their manufacturing is gonna continue to grow. But the US has a leading top, right now, top of the, of the, whole, of the whole market, even though we've got, what, 5% of the population. So the fact is, we continue to be a, a big manufacturer in, uh, in this country. Uh, it's also a fact that most manufacturers, and I, I know there's a breakout session on this, are having trouble finding skilled workforce. At the NAM, we talk about the fact that there are 600,000 jobs going unfilled, 5%, because of the, the lack of skills. And I know in our company, um, we have about 5% of our jobs that are on our VermeerJobs.com site that are not filled, and we fill them, and then we have more jobs put on. And it is, uh, often it is because finding the right skills. In fact, our HR people have said that about only about 20% of people that apply, because we get a lot of applications, really have the skills that they need. And we're willing to train. Obviously, you need to have soft skills as well. But skills shortage is also a fact. Also a fact is that 60% of our exports as a country are manufactured goods. Now, we're not 60% of the GDP, but 60% of what we export, with ag being uh, about one-tenth of that, 
And I'm from Iowa. Iowa is a great agricultural state. And usually when I speak around the state, manufacturing is 17% of the gross state product in, in the state of Iowa. Actually, second, I believe, to Indiana. I think Indiana's number one. I think Iowa's number two. And when I say that we export 10 times more manufactured goods than ag goods in Iowa, which is true, they, people find that hard to believe because we export lots and lots of corn and soybeans and beef and pork. But the fact is, we do. We export 10 times more manufactured goods. So manufacturing continues to be a huge, uh, a huge and vital need in this country. One of my favorite fun facts is that for every dollar we as manufacturers produce, it spins off another dollar 35 cents in other goods and services. Huge leverage effect, uh, leveraging effect in manufacturing. There are some brochures on the back tables with this cover on it, and it gives you a lot more detail than I have time to share with you uh, this morning. But really talking about a manufacturing renaissance, we believe right now is manufacturing's time. It is a great time to be a manufacturer. There's more spotlight on manufacturing now than there's been for maybe decades. Uh, manufacturing is leading us out of a recession uh, from the president to his administration to Republican candidates. They're all talking about manufacturing and jobs and good jobs and talking a bit more about the skills gap as well. But it is time for a manufacturing rebirth in this country. And I think not only from a, a rebirth, we've been there and we've, we've continued to grow and our, our output continues to grow actually with probably sometimes less people because of our productivity improvement, right? We're also the most productive industry in our country. Uh, but it's also a great time because I think we're getting the message out better to the general public. Certainly, hopefully, all of you are giving this message to your employees as well. So for, the NAM has four goals that we really want to focus on. Uh, we have the goal of making sure that we continue to be the best country in the world to manufacture and to attract foreign investment, to have uh, our, a lot of our great partners that have their corporate offices in other countries come and manufacture in, for the North American market in our country. Um, and this is a great goal. We do have challenges, though, as well. Uh, the Manufacturing Institute last summer, they came up with a new number that it's 20% more expensive for us as manufacturers in the U.S. than for a lot of our trading partners. And this does not include labor. This is things like the fact that our, we have the highest corporate tax rate now in the world. Uh, we use a lot of energy, but we need a comprehensive energy policy. Manufacturers use a third of the energy in the country. We need to have all kinds of the, all of the options on, on energy. Uh, we have high health care costs. We have high tort costs, the highest in the world. Um, we also do not have the infrastructure we need, right, but to move people, products, ideas around our country. So we need to upgrade our infrastructure. And, um, and, and we also need to make sure that uh, we are looking at all the regulations. Uh, $1.7 trillion is spent on regulations in our country. And that's an extra cost. So all of those things add up to what makes us 20% higher in our costs than a lot of our trading partners. So those are the kinds of things the NAM is working on and is trying to make sure that we're talking to the administration about and to all of our elected officials and, and making sure that, that, is, that they understand the importance of manufacturing and the importance of sometimes the policies that need to be changed in order to make sure we stay the best. Number two goal is to make sure that we are a great place to not only fulfill domestic demand, but also to export from. 95% of consumers are outside the United States. I believe it's something like 85% plus of GDP growth is outside the United States. Had the opportunity a couple weeks ago to meet uh, the president of Brazil, President Dilma Rosa, and she mentioned that 56% of GDP growth is in the BRICS in Brazil, in Russia, in India, in China, in South Africa. And guess what? We don't have a single free trade agreement with any of those countries. We have a manufacturing surplus of $30 billion where we have, man in manufacturing, where we have free trade agreements. We have a $430 billion deficit where we don't have free trade agreements. Free trade agreements make a, make a, make a big difference. For us, uh, our top country we export to is, is Australia. 
Partly it's the products, their economy's been good, but it's also the fact that we've got the free trade agreement with Australia. And Canada, you know, we, we export a lot to Canada also, free trade agreements. So a big part of what the NAM does is really works with, again, administration, Congress on the importance of trade and the importance of how can we tear down some of the tariffs and the non-tariff barriers for manufacturers in order for us to be able to export. The third goal is to make sure we've got the workforce for the 21st century, um, and the skills gap is real. The uh, NAM, along with the Institute, is working on a project for 500,000 credentially skilled manufacturing workers by 2015. I know this is happening in different pockets around the country. Our company is working with uh, one of the community colleges and another company to uh, credential welding um, uh, people. So they've got the weld credentials, which are nationally recognized. And we do a lot of our own training, but we're also getting involved in, in the community kinds of training. So a lot of, a lot of emphasis and focus on how do we skill up our, our workforce. And um, if I have a little time later, well, let, let me just very quickly say, one thing we've done in our company, and I, I think it's a, a practice I'd love to see more people do. Every summer we have high school teachers from a 70 mile radius come into Vermeer, and we try to focus on the STEM. Of science, uh, technology, engineering, you know, math folks. But uh, they come in for three weeks. They learn a little bit about every part of the business. They are on a Kaizen for a week, and then they focus on one project that they're particularly interested in. They might be with IT, they might be in marketing, they might be uh, with an engineering project. And they understand when they leave, not only the soft skills, but what are the math skills, the reading skills, the communication, the ability to solve problems when they leave, and they go back then and are able to say to the students, hey, you need to have these skills. I don't care what you think you're going to do in life. If you're not going to go on to a community college or a four-year, you need to have these skills to get a good job. And they also see the great opportunities there are in manufacturing. I had, a couple years ago, I had one of the teachers say, after I presented a bunch of facts about manufacturing from the, from the NAM, I had the teacher say to me, wow, that's really interesting. I have never encouraged a student to go into manufacturing because I thought it was leaving this country. So uh, we have found that this teacher internship is a great way, it's an investment for the future, but it's amazing how even though your teachers may be in your community, they don't know one iota about what you do or what the skills are needed for today's workforce. And then the fourth goal is to make sure that we're a great place to do research and development. Um, over half of the research and development in this country is done by manufacturers, not by all the labs, you know, and the institutes. It's done by manufacturing, and we need to make sure, for one thing, that we get a permanent R&D tax credit. You know, it's been in the works, talked about. We don't know why this isn't passing, but it's not. But that's one of the big ones, and there are other things that we work on. Again, get the, get the book in the back so you can uh, you can pick that up. Um, so that, those are kind of the four big goals. Lots of work is done. Um, I, I would just, I'm gonna do the soft sell here, but if you're not an NAM member, boy, I would love to have you join the NAM. We're 12,000 companies, uh, all kinds of industries. You know, um, it, we look at the broad basis, what's important for manufacturing. Um, looking at where there's maybe overreach in some of the agencies and what can we do about that. We've got a phenomenal staff in Washington and in, in uh, regional offices around the country that are working every day for manufacturers and get you involved, get your people involved and realize that this is something we've got to stand up for and, and make our voices heard for manufacturing and for the future. So with that, I'm going to open it up to some questions. I think I've got a few minutes for questions. My name is Al Shepard. I work for Unicor. Um, my question relates to, you were inferring that perhaps uh, there's a gap in the training and also uh, the facts that manufacturing is actually uh, on an upswing within the United States and that uh, somehow we should actually begin to bridge the skills gaps uh, and perhaps that some of the uh, some of the programs within uh, community colleges or colleges themselves do not begin to uh, do that for us. I'm sorry, I'm not getting the question. 
Yes. Are you just saying, am I saying that? Um, I, do, I do think the community colleges are phenomenal partners with manufacturers. Um, I don't want to be misleading on that. Um, we work with several community colleges. We hire almost every machinist we can who graduates. We have co-op programs with, with uh, community colleges. We also hire a lot of welders from there. Um, so there, there, I think a lot of good things in community colleges. Not all students go to a four-year or a community college, and that's one of the things with our teacher internship program is we want to make sure that teachers realize that if they have a student who's not looking at a four-year, you know, are they looking at maybe the two-year? Um, just because that can give them some really great skills training. But I'm, we're also saying that K through 12 needs to be improved. And I know our state, our governor has a big focus on education right now and, and skilling up. And you know, it, you know, I think about it. Today, my manufacturing company today is not like it was when my dad was there. Uh, we need different skills today. We have over 100 numerically controlled machines, you know. Well, you need to have good math skills to do welding, uh, to do the quality checks. And so um, you need a different set of skills today than you did 10, 15, 20 years ago. And I think not only um, have maybe we not kept up within our states, but boy, globally we haven't kept up. This is, a, I read this a couple months ago in the Harvard Business Review that there was a test done with 15-year-olds around the world in 34 different countries, and it's a comparable testing, and um, our 15-year-olds in the United States came out 17th in reading, 22 in science, and 25 in math out of 34. I don't think we're too proud about that. And um, the Chinese 15-year-olds took it for the first time in 2009, and you think, okay, well, they stacked the deck. They took all their brightest and best. I mean, hopefully the survey was done with, with, with good rules and good standard work. Um, they came out number one in all three. So we are competing globally, and we need to make sure we are continuing to up our, you know, the education and the skills, the skill levels, that our young people are getting in K through 12 and in community colleges and in four-year institutions. I think probably like you, um, welders is the number one job we are looking for. Almost 40% of our jobs often, 30 to 40, will be welders. Um, and we train a whole lot ourselves as well as this skills certification with the NAM, uh, as well as the community colleges. And then the second group is engineers that we're mostly looking for. And you probably have the same exact same thing. So I hope I answered that question. I, other questions? Hello, I'm yes. Bruce, Bruce Brunditsky. I work for Corn Truck in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Uh, what, what have you done to integrate the plants to collect data, and then how is that utilized in the lean process? Okay, I'm not sure I totally get this. How, how do our plants collect data? Yes. Well, uh, for one thing, um, when we started the lean journey, we, we, you know, are really into visual and not to computerize everything, right? But, I mean, we, hours per unit, we do time studies, we, you know, go out before, after. So, I'm not saying we've got still the greatest data that we'd like to have, but we do, we collect hours per unit, you know, days, really trying, again, even sometimes in our value stream mapping, you know, again, check out those times. Um, we've one of our annual improvement projects this year is really taken our continuous improvement <laughs> up a notch. And so uh, last year, and my my director of CI is here, uh, Jason uh, connect, conducted multiple multiple value stream mapping events, week long events, to get again more of that basic data of uh, hours per unit, um, the time start to finish, the lead time through the plants and inventory and all of that. So, I mean, we, we just go out and collect it. Um, again, not, not with an ERP system necessarily, but by going out and doing, making sure we get the real data. I'm sorry if I didn't get your question. Come up afterwards if I, if I, if I totally missed that. Yeah. 
Actually, now I have two questions, if I can squeeze them in. Um, from our Sunday visitor here in Indiana, the first question I had was related, very impressed with the number of languages and the skills you've got to address your global requirements. Um, you know, in, particularly in the Midwest, multiple language skills aren't readily available. So it, can you comment a little bit more on how you deliberate, I assume you deliberately went about doing that and what roles those people are in? Yeah, absolutely, great question. Um, I think, think you all heard that, where, how, do you, how do you get the language skills? I know there we are in Iowa with 18 different languages, you know, spoken, and most of those are, a lot of them are engineers. Okay, a lot are engineers. Um, not all working in engineering, though. Some of them, we've got a, a Chinese gal who worked for us in Beijing, and she's now working in our CI department and working with our, um, with our value stream, particularly with our suppliers, because that's she was head of supply in, uh, in China. <laughs> so she's, she's, of course, got her skills. But we've got the multiple languages, again, a lot engineering. And we pull those people when we need them or into corporate engineering so they work across our mile. Um, but, but we're being more intentional about that than we used to be. I would say some of this fell in our lap and some of it now we're being more intentional. We are really, even as we, we're going to have 40 interns this summer, college interns. And as we even choose the interns, we look at young people that have another skill, another language. Because often, a great example, a couple years ago, we had a great intern, and he um, grew up in Brazil, so and has lived various places, but speaks great Portuguese and also Spanish. And he's now one of our key leads down in Latin America for us, working out of our, the Brazilian office. Um, and so we're really trying to look as, even with the interns, because those, you know, we have a good percentage of interns that we're able to fire, hire full-time afterwards that have language skills. Um, and, and right now, we've just established an office um, about an hour and a half away from our, from our main plant in, at, near um, ISU, Iowa State University, and are trying to attract students to do co-op, you know, 10 to 20 hours a week programs through the school year because we're right on campus. But we also are looking for it to be a way for us to attract some of the international students that are at ISU and work on projects with us on a part-time basis, maybe full-time in the summer. And then, you know, our hope is that they go back, actually, to the regions, but with Vermeer. So there's a lot of different ways to, um, to do this. Um, um, I'm very excited because in our private school in Pella next year, we're going to have a Spanish immersion program. So I've got two granddaughters, kindergarten and first grade, uh, who will be full-time, every day, learning Spanish because they're in the Spanish Immersion Program. You know, just a lot of great stuff about language, but if a child learns early on, I think under six, another language, it's much easier for them to learn more languages. And it, it's just fantastic for their capability of um, understanding and solving problems. So, um, yeah, we're doing mul multiple fronts, but, you know, really trying to now be much more intentional in looking as we hire people of if they do have language skills and focusing first off on those interns that we've got coming in. I think I might have time for another one or two. Hi, I'm uh, Steve Burgess from LB Foster. Question on your uh, vendor managed inventory. The, how broad is that? Is that uh, domestic? Oh, that's the, the sell one, buy one concept, maybe I. I oh, the dealer that. managed? Yeah, yeah the, the replenishment? Right. Is that, um, is that domestic? Yeah, it's big. We started, we started actually with two model dealers to help us get the program started, work out the kinks. Um, by the way, we, and I know Jason's going to talk about this in, in the session tomorrow, um, we have taken a lot of the lean training and concepts and Kaizen events to our dealers, our, our industrial dealers. Now we're starting with our forage dealers. And it's a phenomenal process to do. I mean, it's kind of one of my life goals is that every part of Vermeer, everybody connected with Vermeer is into the lean culture. And so uh, what, you, what you find, we've been on events, I think in all of our principals in North America and some outside of North America in, in our industrial group, and you, you, you're able to solve problems together. And so as we work on a lot of things, whether it's warranty or parts or any kind of process that affects the dealer and us, 
we try to get our dealers involved in that, and they've already been doing shop floor events at their offices. They've already been doing events on accounts receivable and payables and their own warranty and taking waste out of any of their processes. So then you get on a sticky wiki issue, you know, like warranty or something like that, and work together on it, and you get out the real, you know, the present state and where do you want to go and what are we going to have to do in between and what are all the steps. You talk the same language, so it's, it's phenomenal. But the replenishment system is um, really North America based, although we also, with our regional offices, hold some buffer, and we have the replenishment system with our regional offices as well. So um, I, yeah, I'd like to see more of it with our international. We'll continue to, to, to work that and to keep, you know, keep broadening the span. Uh, we do have a little different, obviously, scenario when you've got, when you've got uh, long shipping times. A number of our dealers also have rental um, fleets. And actually, even though those are bigger products and maybe not on, quote, the replenishment system, they pretty much use it as a replenishment system. They have a, used, they have a piece of equipment that's been in their rental fleet. They sell it. They order another one. So it's more manual. It's not as automatic. but. Um, yeah, we've really focused initially on, on uh, the domestic and then our regional offices. Good morning. Yes. Good morning. Is this on? It's working. Hello? Check. It's working now, yes? Okay. Oh, there you go. Oh, good morning. Uh, my, name is, my name is Adam Zack, and I work for a small firm that specializes in recruiting executives with lean and continuous improvement backgrounds. And I've been to a number of conferences and heard many CEOs speak about their involvement in lean. Mary, with your, uh, spe specifically your last response, you demonstrated how deeply involved you are, in fact, um, in the day-to-day -day activities. And therefore, uh, to me, that, that's a tremendous sign of how successful you've been as an organization. The problem that we often see in manufacturing in the U.S. is there are very few CEOs or even senior level executives below that, below that rank who take such a deep interest. They talk a great game, but they don't actually do all that much and certainly don't have the depth of your knowledge. How are we going to change that to make American manufacturing more competitive? What advice would you have for us? Um, I would I would say and I and I know that is an issue and I have been on about 40 events and I, you know, I'm not actually real proud of the, the number I have not been on the last couple of years but but I've done a third shift TP TPM event you know and it was great it was great with the third shift people uh, seeing all the morning people come in and seeing what you can do on a third shift uh, but, but anyway, I, you know, and that's why we're actually doing the CI Blitz Weeks. This, I want to get my executives back on, and my top executives last, the last time were on the shop floor events. It's really important. Your people on the floor see you. This is important. So how do you get your COs involved? Um, I know that um, our consulting company, TBM, will take CEOs on plant tours. And because we've, we've been one of the plants they visited, and we'll talk about CEO involvement. I mean, I think, you know, I think, you, I mean, Art, 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 uh, Art Byrne was the one who said to me, you've got to be on events. You've got to be on events. And um, that, I, believe, I believed it, and I found it to be true. I learned more by being on event about our company, about the process, and about the products. And all the opportunities we had to continually do quality improvement, take waste out of, out of how we design it, you know, how we build it. Um, and I, that's why I think it's still so important that we all go back on the floor every year and get into the process. So I, I think it's, it's saying to your CEOs, please go talk to a CEO that you know who is really involved. Because it, it is a culture. And you, I don't think you can really, um, you, can, you need to understand, you're not going to understand everything as CEO, but you need to understand enough about the process to ask the right questions and to give it full support, absolutely full support. And, you know, I'm always, uh, I'm a former teacher, kindergarten teacher, 
And uh, as a kindergarten teacher, I was always wondering, okay, how do I connect with each one of these kids in the class? How do I, how do all of a sudden the light bulb come on so they, they see that those letters go together and they, they spell words? And I have found the same thing with Lane, that you, know, you, you need to figure out how to connect with the people on the floor at all levels and how do, how do you connect with them? And we've, we've done a, a, a lot in that area. But I also, I also uh, totally know that that is an issue. And so, you know, how, sometimes it's best practices. CEOs learn from other CEOs or other people in leadership. And, um, and I'm actually kind of a, a, a broken record on this, saying to other CEOs, no, you, you yourself have to get involved. It's not just going to Friday presentations or even just going to visit the teams, although that's important. All of that's important too. But um, to understand the process and, and, you know, when you understand, I mean, I was on the first events that we did on this replenishment with our dealers. I went down to Texas with a group of the dealers and we had a couple way to trigger event who figured out how we were going to do this replenishment and we did a shop floor event. I was on the shop floor. I cleaned the steps, I cleaned the hose reels, uh, I did the spaghetti charts, uh, and it's, you know, it's great. The biggest thing obviously is time. Time is always the problem, always the problem. And so, you know, you really have to just be pretty dogmatic about putting it in your schedule and saying, I am doing this. And that's kind of why we actually thought, We'll have two weeks where we get the executives on these teams and we will we'll try to eliminate all other meetings then. You know, and they get in their calendar so that they can be, they can be on the team. So, uh, not, not a, a great question and not an easy one to answer. But I think we do learn from each other. You know, we learn best practices from each other and uh, wherever you can point a person, and I've talked to a lot of other CEOs, about this journey and what it takes, and I think I almost always make a big point about their involvement, and not just on a high level, but really getting involved. How am I doing? I think I've used up all my time. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Have a great conference.